Welcome everyone to the final day of the 2021 spring Martin Gardner celebration of Mind Talks. I'm your host for this talk, Bob Hearn, and uh, it's my great pleasure today to have Colin Wright. Um, those of you who attend Gathering for Gardner are very, very familiar with Colin. He's a familiar face. Also one of the uh, simultaneous inventors of juggling site swap notation for you jugglers. You're probably familiar with that already. Um, Colin today is going to be speaking on a subject that is very near and dear to my heart. Computational complexity is applied to puzzles and games. In particular, colors can compute. Thanks, Bob. It's uh, great to be here. It's, it's a great honor to be addressing uh, and uh, love to be here. So um, the one thing I want to say at the very beginning is I know that we have a very wide range of uh, experience in the audience. There are people who already know quite a lot about this subject, and there are people who know nothing about this subject. So uh, to all of you, I'm going to say uh, I hope to give you give something for everybody. So for those who already know something about it, I hope to ping a few things. I hope for those who already know something about this, I hope this will be a, a familiar overview of a lot of things that you you uh, you already know and are familiar with. Although with any luck, I'll mention a few things that, that you don't know. For those of you who aren't familiar with any of this, um, don't worry, play along. Um, if you get lost, don't panic. I hope to pick you up as we go along. It's not going to be a, a really in-depth talk. This is intended to be um, a very high-level overview. So let me just give you a very brief outline of how we're going. Don't be scared of this. Uh, this is the way I think. This is the way I think about this kind of talk. Uh, this is a, a bubble diagram of uh, all of the topics I'm going to be covering, uh, most of them very quickly and from a very high level. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about um, colouring a network. Oh yeah, as it says here, I'm going to cover a, a, a lot of ground, but I'm going to look at it from a very, very high level. So if you're not familiar with this, it's just an overview to show you some of the stuff. Uh, if you are familiar with this, then, then you'll know what I'm skipping over uh, and you'll know uh, what to ask me about at, uh, towards the end. So I'm going to talk about coloring a network. Now, some of you are familiar with coloring maps. Some of you will know about the four color theorem. And that's actually where I'm going to start when I'm picking off that. But that's, that's where I'm going to start. But I'm also going to talk about computers and how computers work, literally at, at, at sort of a very, very low level. Uh, I'm not going to go through a whole derivation of that. We don't have time. I don't have the knowledge. Um, but with any luck, I'll, I'll give you an overview of the internals of how a computer works. And then I'm going to pull these together. Uh, the title of the talk, Colors Can Compute, I want to talk about colorings, I want to talk about computation, and then I'm going to marry those two. And we'll, we'll tidy up at the end by saying why this isn't just a game, why this is actually very important uh, and, and critically important and some of the implications that, that follow from it. So that's just a... Uh, an extreme, that's an, that's an ISS view of the talk. And I'm going to mostly be at a 30,000 foot view, at, at, a, uh, at a jetliner view of the topic as we go rapidly over the surface. Um, so we'll start with coloring. I mentioned the four color theorem. This is a great book uh, written by a friend of mine, Robin Wilson, um, where he talks about what the problem is and how the problem is solved. Now, many of you know this, uh, so I'm not going to go into this in, in great deal of detail. But the basic idea is that when we have a map, how many colors does it take to color it if two regions that join each other must get different colors? Now, I don't care if they meet at a corner. I only care if they share a length of border. It was originally stated in 1852, not only finally solved in, in 1976, although there were actually a couple of gaps in the proof, but the, the um, style of proof, the nature of proof, the method of proof, um, was sound, uh, although it raised a lot of controversy because it was computer assisted. If you want to ask me about that in the questions, I can tell you a little bit about that afterwards. But the basic idea is that we have a map. Now, this is one that uh, I made. Actually, I think I pulled this off a random place on the internet and modified it slightly. And the idea here is that two uh, regions that share a length of boundary have to get different colors. So I might color the outside ring uh, red, and then we can look at the colors of these two regions. They can't be colored red. 
each of them shares a, a boundary with the red region. So they, they're not allowed to be red and they're not allowed to be the same as each other because they share uh, a, a boundary as well. So we have to color these not red and different from each other. So let's just color them uh, blue and green. Now for anybody here who has one of the color blindnesses, I'm really sorry. It's only quite recently that I've become aware of of how much I use color. And I really should have been putting letters in these to make it clearer. So my bad. And anybody else who prepares talks, this is something you need to think about. But I'm just going to have to press on here. Uh, and I will call the colors as we go. So these are uh, blue and green. And then we can look at the color of this one. It can't be blue and it can't be green, but it can be red. So we can color that one red, the one at the bottom. Oh, okay, that's brilliant, Bob. Uh, so the one at the bottom, that can't be green or red, so it could be blue, so we can color those using nothing other than the colors we already have. But now this one, it can't be red, it can't be green, it can't be blue. So it has to be something different. So, so let's make that one yellow. So we've used four colors so far. Uh, and and uh, let's see how we go. What about, well, we can keep trying to color this. Now, one of the things that makes this interesting is sometimes you'll color on, you'll color on, and you'll reach a region that needs a fifth color. But you always find if you backtrack and change decisions, if you had a decision to make, maybe you chose the wrong one early and you need to change your decision. Here, I know that this one can be pushed through this region here. It can't be yellow, blue, or red, so it has to be green. And, and in fact, I can complete this one with only four colors. So the four color theorem says on any plane or sphere, any map requires no more than four colors. And it's not enough just to show that you can't have five regions that all touch each other. Uh, it might be that things get forced, and this turns out to be quite tricky. You can show that no map needs more than five. You can do that with pencil and paper. You can show maps that require four, like this one. Uh, but to find, map, to, to find a proof that no map requires more than four was a great challenge. And one of the techniques that was used uh, in trying to solve this problem was to generalize so that you don't have to deal with coloring regions in maps. So what happens is we'll, we'll change the way we think about this. Instead of thinking about coloring the region, you might think of that as a country or a state. Instead of coloring the region, let's color the capital of the region. So here's our, our original map, and we have a capital city in this one. And the idea is that we color the capital and then the country inherits the color of the capital. So that's an easy way of seeing that these two things would be equivalent. Uh, and I can color this one. Now these two regions, these two countries share a border. So how do we show that if we're only coloring the countries? And what we do is we say if two capitals, if the countries share a border, then we will put in a trunk route between them. We'll put in a road connecting those two capitals. And the rule that if they share a border, then they have to get different colors. Now the rule is if two places are joined by a road, they must get different colors. So we can do that with all of the neighbors here. All of these neighbors must get different colors. And you think, hang on, there's an extra bit of border here, but actually that's a part of the same border that we've already got marked. So, so in fact, we don't need that. Well, that seems like a you, know, you might think, why do we do this? And in fact, if you start doing this for this map, you start thinking, well, that's just a huge mess. I mean, that's just horrendous. I mean, why, why would you do this? This is horrible. Coloring the regions is nice and neat and clean. Why, why, why would you do this? And the end, well, people tried it because they thought this might be a way to, to solve the original problem and it was just a thing they tried, it turns out that this is a great thing to do. Uh, because if I really do have five things and I want them to be colored differently, if I've got a different context and I have five things like uh, five teachers and I want to schedule them to classrooms at different times and the times are the colors and I've got five teachers and I want them all to have different colors, I can't do that with a map. 
the theorem says that with a map, you never need more than four. So this thing that I might want to achieve can't be achieved using the map, but it can be achieved using the network if we allow the lines in the network to cross. So here I've got five different nodes, five different places, five different regions, and I've connected them all with trunk routes. Uh, where the trunk routes cross, they, there is no intersection. They, they go under and over, so there's no intersection. Um, and so here, this will require five colors. And I can make uh, networks that require as many colors as you like. It's easy. You just put down as many nodes as you want and, and just join them all to each other. And so that, that can work. So suddenly, I've gained an ability by switching to thinking about coloring networks. So the rule is that if two networks are joined by a line, joined by a road, then they have to get different colors. And, and that's, that's where we're going to go is with coloring networks. We gain generality by doing this. And we can also put on extra conditions. So here's one that I'm going to come to later. It's actually uh, network C, I think, if you've downloaded that. But we're going to, if you want to play along later, that's what it's going to be. But here I can put on extra conditions because you'll see that some of my nodes are round and some of them are diamond shapes. And what I can say here is the diamonds are not allowed to be blue. You're going to use red, green, and blue, but the diamonds are not allowed to be blue, right? Okay, so I can put on an extra condition, and I'm going to carry that one through. I'll remind you. Um, so with this one, we can use red, green, and blue, uh, but the diamonds may not be blue. And in fact, uh, let's do this one. Let's color this one now. So if you're playing along, then you should have that. Uh, and I'm going to have one here. Now I'm going to try and switch to sharing a different screen here, and we'll see if this can be made to work. I think this is the one I want to have. So here we go. I've got that network. I haven't got all of labels. If you're, if you're playing along, try and color this red, green, and blue, but you're not allowed to use blue on the diamonds, okay? But anything else is possible. So uh, I'm just going to color this one uh, red and red and green. Okay, so those are my colors, red, red, and green. Uh, so now, how do we color this? Well, I know that this one here is not allowed to be blue, and it's next to a red, so that one has to be green. And this one is next to a green, and it's next to a red, so this one has to be blue, and this one now has to be red. Uh, this one, can't tell, it's next to a red and a red. So I can't tell. Oh, this one, it can't be blue, um, but it also can't be red. So this one has to be green. And this one can't be blue, so this one has to be red. And now this one also has to be blue. Uh, this one has to be green, so this one has to be red. So I've succeeded in doing that, and it wasn't very difficult. OK, uh, later on, we're going to try these again. So uh, if you are playing along, great, you can carry on. I'm going to switch back to. Um, my, my presentation now, assuming this works. Here we go. Right, so let's try and color this one. Um, well, we'll come back to it. I've already done one. It seems simple. It seems like a game. It seems like it's not that difficult. It feels like it's a toy problem. Uh, it seems to have no point, but that turns out not to be the case. It turns out to be, well, usually it's easy, but it's, sometimes it's hard and those ones matter. So let's figure out which ones? Now I'm going to switch. I have been talking about coloring. Now I'm going to talk about computers. I'm going to go fairly quickly through this. This is basically setting the scene for you. So, so how do computers work? How do computers actually work? Uh, somebody said we trapped lightning in a rock and tricked it into thinking. And, and I have a friend who, who works in this field and, and he complains because silicon isn't actually a rock. It's not really, well, that's, that's nitpicking and it's fair enough from that point of view. But I think this is a nice nice idea. So what do we do? How do we trick it into thinking? Well, basically, we make transistors. Uh, here is a, a diagram of a field effect transistor. And the basic idea is these red regions form two terminals. And we want to have current passing between them. Or not, we might want a switch. And so this thing here, which is called a gate, opens and closes the switch. It's a gate. It opens and closes to allow current to flow 
or not. So basically we need a, a switch that's controlled by electricity. Uh, a relay does that. The early computers were made with relays, um, but then they, they started to use silicon. Uh, this is a different diagram of the same idea, uh, showing the plate across the top of a depletion region, which you either populate or depopulate to allow current to flow or not. It's a switch. You think, okay, what, what, can, what can you do with a switch? Well, here is a circuit, and what I have is the green across the top is a positive power supply, and the red at the bottom is ground or earth or zero volts. Uh, and I've got two of these switches, but one of them turns on when you give it current, and the other one turns off. But if you take away current, then the bottom one turns off and the top one turns on. So, so to, to put that into, um, uh, in, to make it, to give you the example, if I take away current, if I put the input to ground, this one here, the top one, um, switches on, but the bottom one switches off. The bottom one switches off because it has no current. The gate has been left open. Well, the gate's closed because current can't flow. The analogies are really tricky when you start to try and say this sort of thing. That one's off, but this one's on. So that means the current can flow from the top through the switch to the output, and the output is therefore turned on. So in this case, if the input is off, the output is on. And the opposite happens. If the input is on, you can trace this through. The output is off. If I'm going too fast for you, don't panic. You can come back and watch this later. It doesn't really matter. I'm setting the scene for you. If, uh, if you're following this in detail, you know that I'm lying ever so slightly, uh, but it's, it's close enough. So I can make a circuit, and this is an inverter. Whatever the input is, the output is the opposite. And here's the cool thing. If I have a network that looks like this and I force this top node to be blue, what happens to the other ones? Well, if this one's green, this one's red. But if this one's red, this one's green. So provided I have a triangle and I can force this top node to be blue, the bottom two nodes are acting like an inverter. It's, it's a not gate. It, it's, its output is on. If the input is not on, it's an inverter. So this is a coloring equivalent of that circuit that I've just drawn for you. Now, the network is working as a logic gate. There are other logic functions. So the AND function is one of the most important that we have. And here, the output is true. The output is on. The output is one if and only if A and B are on. And, uh, and we can do that as well. So here is a network which I claim acts like an AND gate. Now remember, we can use red and green, but not uh, the diamonds are not allowed to be blue. And I invite you to color this. Try coloring this. And I'm going to do the same. So here we go. Uh, I'm going to go back to my camera. And I've got, uh, I've got this one here. So I'm going to do the same. And on this occasion, remember, the, the, the diamonds are not allowed to be blue. So I'm going to make this green. And what does that mean? Well, this one is now attached to both red and green, so this one must be blue. And this one is attached to green and blue, so this one must be red. And this one up here must be green. This one over here must be red. And this one must be green. So there's only one way of going. Now, uh, you may try and play along with that if you like. I'm going to do another example. I'm going to do this on the screen, I think, if I remember my slides correctly. So I'm going to switch back to the screen. If you've uh, printed out one of those networks, then you can have a go at doing that. Uh, but let's have a go at doing it here. Uh, red, green, and blue, but the diamonds may not be blue. So let's color this one red and see what happens. OK, uh, what color is this one? Well, it's attached to both uh, green and red, so that has to be blue. 
This one is attached to blue and red, so it has to be green. And the diamond down the bottom is a diamond, so it can't be blue. It's attached to a green, so it uh, must be red. Uh, this middle circle can be blue. And in fact, this one, B, can be anything you like. So there's, there's more than way, one way of coloring this. But here, I've just shown that if this is red, i.e. false, then the output must be red. There was no choice about what the output would be. So this is basically behaving as an AND gate. So this network is behaving as an AND gate. And in fact, there are other logic functions. Uh, in truth, in silicon, it's faster to make a NAND gate, which is the same as an AND gate, but the output is, is reversed. And the reason for that, uh, you can make it easily and quickly out of the field effect transistors. And these are nice and stable and have power driving and, and everything works nicely. And the layout on the silicon, this is literally a diagram of the layout on the silicon. Uh, in, in truth, these paths are one tenth of the width of a human hair. They are tiny and they fit billions of these on a big, on a big chip. They're, they're, it's it's mind bogglingly amazing what they do. Uh, but that's the actual layout of, an, of, a, of a NAND gate. And we put lots of these on and we can do things like adding up. So if you know how to add up in binary, if I give you the input here, green, red, green, how many greens are there? There are two. And if you trace through this circuit, these are NAND gates. If you trace through this circuit, you find that we get a carry of one and a sum of zero. So we've got one zero. It's an adder. It's a, it's a one bit adder. And that's using NAND gates. Now, if you, if you, you can trace through all of these possibilities and I, um, one rainy afternoon actually drew diagrams of all of them. And here you go, if all three are on, then we need a carry and a sum. So they're, they're both on in that case. Um, if you're interested in chasing this down, I'm not gonna chase this any further. There are actually websites where it's, it's set up as a game and you can actually start with NAND gates and go all the way through to building a computer on which you can play Tetris. Just, just use your, your favorite search engine and look for from NAND to Tetris. You can Google it on Bing or Bing it on DuckDuckGo or, or whatever you like. Uh, and there's a website. Um, so you can, you can go and have a look at those. The, the magic was is NAND and Tetris. If you, if you look for those, you'll be fine. Um, so back to coloring. Suppose again, I challenge you to color this network. This is network C. And you can use red, green, and blue, but diamonds are not allowed to be blue. So here we go. My claim is that these three nodes here, X, Y, and Z, how many of them are green is given to you in the answer at the bottom. I claim that this is an one bit adder circuit. Now, uh, I've already used my, uh, my one here. Uh, if I quickly draw one, I'm gonna do this. I'm, I'm gonna do this very, very, uh, very, very quickly. I really am gonna put that under there so I can trace it. So what I've got here is my diamonds are here. My diamond is here. My diamond is here. I've got, oh, that's a diamond. That's a circle. If you're playing along, then you should be playing along. Ah, now I need to switch to my camera so you can see me flailing about with this. So have a go at coloring this. Uh, there we go. New share. Go to my camera. Um, well, no, wrong one. Sorry. Um, that one. Right. So here we go. Uh, circle, circle, diamond, diamond, diamond. Now I'm going really fast here because I'm going to run out of time. There's so much interesting stuff here that can be done if uh, if I if I don't race through this. So what I'm going to do now, if you're playing along, you can have a go at this. But I'm going to make this red, green, and green. So what have I got? This has to be blue because it's attached to those. This is a diamond, so that has to be green. Um, this has to be red, so this has to be green. Uh, this is a diamond, so that has to be green, so that has to be red. It's emerged already. 
Um, this one is attached to red and green, so that has to be blue, and this one is going to be red. So I can, I've, I've practiced this. I've spent far too long doing this. So if you're not following, don't panic. Uh, I've done far, far too many of these sorts of things. Let's go back to my, uh, to my presentation so we can, we can chase through the diagram there. Um, so let's see. Um, okay, so I claim that we end up with the sum and carry. Let's do an example here. Uh, that's not the same as the one I've just done, thank goodness. Uh, this has to be blue because it's next to red. Uh, this one down here has to be blue because it's next to, um, sorry, the one at the top has to be green because it's next to red and it can't be blue. This one down here has to be blue. Um, then this one up here, it's next to a blue and a green, so it has to be red. Uh, this one down here is next to a blue and a red, so it has to be green. This one has to be I was expecting somebody to put it in the chat, but you didn't. That one has to be red. Uh, this one over here, it can't be blue, so it has to be uh, red. Uh, this one then has to be green, and this one at the top has to be blue. And look, it's counted how many greens there are. So red is zero and green is one, and this is carry, and that's zero. This is sum, is one. Two times carry plus sum is one. There is one green here. This network is doing addition. It's doing one bit addition. It will come as no surprise that we can put lots of these next to each other and end up building a ripple carry. So we can actually end up, end up adding any number of um, any number of, of bits. So we can we can start to add lots of things. But if you think about it, actually adding a whole collection of things. If the input is zero, then the output is zero. If the input is one, it copies it. It's a one bit multiplier. So we can do addition and we can do multiplication by one bit. And suddenly we end up being able to do a lot more. So this one is an adder, it counts. And what we can do is we can start to combine and circuits and adder circuits and we put them in a grid and we can basically make a long multiplication table for multiplying in binary. So we can do multiplication. You don't need to follow this, but, but, uh, but yeah, we can actually do multiplication. But here comes the real surprise. We can run this backwards. So in fact, if you say what you want the answer to be, and then successfully color the network, then the input nodes have to give you the correct input to create that answer. So here, if you color this network, I guarantee you that of X, Y, and Z, two of them will be green. I'm not gonna do that now. Uh, I will let you have a go at doing that later if you want to. You can, you can create the answer you want, color it, and find out what input creates that answer for you. You can run com computation backwards. That's kind of cool, because if you do this for a multiplication grid and run it backwards, you can factor numbers. And if you can factor numbers quickly, you can break most internet security systems. This is now a lie because of uh, elliptic curve factoring and elliptic curve analogs of these things and so on and so on. But uh, if you're looking at RSA, if you're looking at Diffie-Hellman, actually Diffie-Hellman, probably not. But uh, if you're looking at that sort of stuff, in particular, my bank still uses RSA um, on numbers, not on elliptic curves. So uh, if you could do this, if you could color these networks, you can break many existing internet security systems. Uh, and there, there is why this is important. Suddenly this tells you why this is important. Coloring arbitrary, now remember at the very beginning, I said that most networks are really easy to color. That the, uh, the ones that are difficult to color are actually quite rare, but they turn out to be important. When you encode a problem, then that tends to give you a difficult exam, a difficult 
example network to try. If you can color arbitrary networks, not just the easy ones, not just the random ones, but all of them, if you can color all networks efficiently, you can solve a huge number of problems. No, I mean, really, a, a huge number of problems. Breaking internet encryption is one thing, although most internet encryption has now moved beyond that, but you know, still game on. Uh, but you could sell, solve the traveling salesperson problem so you can get efficient routing, more efficient routing or provably optimal uh, routing for your grocery deliveries. Uh, for example, and, and your, your internet shopping, uh, you, can, you can solve bin packing. So how can you best put stuff in a container to ship it across the world to get stuck in the Suez Canal uh, or behind somebody who is stuck in the Suez Canal. So uh, how do you pack these containers efficiently and effectively? Uh, factoring, that's the one that I've just been dealing with. Uh, flow shop scheduling. So uh, places like um, uh, car manufacturers have to be able to coordinate all of the things that go into it. And if you can shave minutes off the manufacturer of a car, you can save a huge amount of money. Timetabling for schools uh, and, and anywhere where you need to have a timetable. Uh, birth allocation, so putting ships into, into harbors. It's been estimated that a 5% improvement on birth allocation schedules in the UK would save around about 100 billion pounds a year. Uh, th these are these are huge problems, huge problems. And if you can color arbitrary networks, then you can actually solve all of these problems. Vehicle routing that goes back to the the traveling salesperson type thing. Um, so vehicle routing is a slightly different problem when you actually do it. It's it's very very similar. All of these problems are what are known as being NP complete. So they are problems which, if somebody claims to have a solution, that, then it's easy to verify that they're correct. That's what we call an NP problem. Um, but these problems are such that if you could solve any of them, then you could leverage that up and solve all of them. There are clever ways of converting NP problems into these sorts of problems. And what I've just shown you with the, with the coloring and the computing is that Graph three coloring or network three coloring can do arbitrary computation. And that's all of these games here. All of these things, uh, basically, they say the same sort of thing. So that's, that's what we're doing here is we've, we've got NP complete going on with that. So, so that, and there, are, there are many more of these. If you go and look up NP complete on, on the interwebs, uh, it's, it's a rabbit hole that just goes on forever. And the challenge is this, how do we find an algorithm to do this? People have been searching, people have been searching diligently for a long time. And the majority of mathematicians believe, that have no proof, but believe that there is no efficient algorithm to solve these problems in general. And that is the question. Is NP complete genuinely hard or are we just missing something? Does it kind of collapse? Is there an algorithm that actually makes all of these things possible? All of these things within reach, all of these things, uh, something that we can do fairly efficiently. Efficient is a, a, an interesting technical term in this context, which I'm not going to go into. People can ask me about that in the questions, and I'll, I'll, I'll mention it. But this basically is P versus NP. So that what I'm saying here is that graph three coloring is NP complete. And if we can solve that, we can solve all of these. But most people believe there is no algorithm. So any problem where it's easy to verify an alleged solution, we can write a computer program to verify that. We can convert it into a network, and then we can run it backwards to find out what the, what the input would be to give that solution. So that's why we say that graph three coloring is NP complete. I've given you a proof. Basically, this is a proof that graph three coloring is NP complete. The challenge is this. Nobody, well, a few people believe it's possible. Most people believe it's not. Um, but this has been an overview of 
why it's important, what, what it's really stating. The challenge now is that it's really hard to prove that finding a certain algorithm is impossible. It's really hard. But if you think you found one, I have an easy way of checking it because I can create networks that you will find hard to color. And now I've given you all the tools that you could find networks that are really hard to color. It's incredibly powerful, this idea, incredibly powerful. And in fact, it's worth a million dollars. So in, in the year 2000, the Clay Math Institute published seven outstanding mathematics problems and offered a bounty of $1 million for each of them, either to solve it or prove that it cannot be solved. Settle, heads, tails, either way you win. At the moment, the coin is still in the air. But that's not why we do maths. That's not why we do maths. We do maths because of the thrill of the chase. We don't study music. We don't learn to play the piano because we want to earn a living out of it or because we want to get prize money. Nice. But no, the vast majority of us will never do that. We don't, we don't look at paintings. We don't look at art because, because it, or we don't do art because we, get, we, we earn stuff out of it. It's nice. We study it because it's exciting. We study it because there's the thrill of finding things out, the joy of finding things out. And, and here, I hope I've given you a very high level overview of just one really deep and rich area of mathematics. Uh, that turns out not to have any numbers in it. And yet it's uh, very much mathematics, very much an area of active research. Uh, and I look forward to, to uh, finding out what questions have been provoked by this. What questions do you have? But for me, for now, pretty much, I'm just gonna say that coloring networks can count, can calculate and can compute, which I think is amazing. And that's why I'm, I love doing maths, because there's so many surprises like this. But for me, for now, uh, I'm just going to leave you with that question. Can you find a way of doing it? The challenge awaits. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Colin. That was a lot of fun. And uh, we had a lot of great comments. People were following along and um, having fun as well. What do you think the outcome of P versus NP will be? Um, my PhD supervisor and one of his PhD students, one of my siblings, thought they'd solved it and thought they'd come up with a polynomial algorithm. And what they did was when they had the idea, they, uh, they then went out and had a really nice dinner, a really great four course meal with, with lovely wines and everything else, and then went home and slept on it and then came in the following morning. So they, they had the evening of euphoria. And then an hour into uh, checking it, they found that they were wrong. Um, so my supervisor was Baylor Bolabash and, and he's still sitting on the fence. But for me, I think P is not equal to NP. Um, but I, I, I've been wrong before um, and I, I'm not one of the people who's actually doing research in this. But there are apparently uh, three ways of, of showing that complexity is um, necessary. And all of those have been shown not to be a viable way of proving this. So that's a, that's a really deep kind of meta comment. They've shown that methods of proving that P is not equal to NP don't work. And so we're still looking for a method that does work. And there's a, a thing where if you have a, a, an oracle, a touchstone of truth, then you can define what you mean by P and NP relative to that touchstone of truth. And it turns out that if you pick a random oracle, P can equal NP. So it depends on which universe we're living in. But personally, no, I, I do not think P equals NP. I believe that, um, that it's, it's fundamentally difficult. Um, so yeah, uh, one of the comments here is from Adam Chalcraft, who's a, a friend of mine. And he says, there are weird computers that have weird extra things. And for them, P does equal NP. And the question is, uh, for the kinds of computers that we're talking about, is that still the case? Uh, and that makes proving it either way hard because kind of in some parallel universes, it's not true. Um, and so the question is, which, which parallel universe are we in? Um, that all sounds very fuzzy, but everything I've said there can be made precise. You really don't want me to do that now, um, but, but it, it can be made precise nevertheless.
I can just add to that, anyone who's ever taken a course in computational complexity theory, when they're asked to uh, prove an algorithm is, is prove a pro better problem is NP complete, uh, has had the experience of saying, ah, I have just found a polynomial algorithm for solving this NP complete problem. Wait till I publish it and get my million dollars. And then, then you, then you, your professor shows you your mistake. It's uh, yeah. everybody's been there. I, I, um, every, everybody's been there and usually yeah. it's something along the lines of I'm going to do this multiplication of these two numbers and that that only takes a <laughs> time but in fact the numbers end yes. up being humongously long and now it matters that multiplying numbers can be done in n log n but but it is n log n or n log n log log n depending on yeah so yeah so a uh, question surely running the adder networks backwards will lead to multiple valid results in the xyz nodes and feeding those back uh, to run predecessor nests will just explode. Yes, that's exactly the problem. That's that's, that's precisely the problem. So in yeah. particular, with the adder network that I have, if you color both of the outputs red, then all of them have to be red. If you color both of the outputs green, all of them have to be green. But if you color uh, it uh, green and red, meaning two, then there are three possible ways to color it. And it's, it's then it, you end up being able to make a choice, but that choice then forces other things. Mm -hmm. So when you're trying to color a general network that turns out to be difficult, you come to a node that you need to color and it's not forced. So you have to make a choice. And usually it's attached to something that you've already colored. So you've got two choices. And then there'll, there'll be another one where you have to make two choices and another one where you have to make two choices. And so the number of choices becomes exponential and it's only much later that you find out that it doesn't work. But you don't know why it doesn't work. It's just that particular collection. And that's why it tends to blow up exponentially. Now, we can do better than that. Uh, there are algorithms that allow us to do better than that. But it still turns out to be exponential. It's not 2 to the power of. It's 1.7 something to the power or 1.6 something to the power of. I don't know the exact number. Um, and better algorithms do succeed in, in, uh, in giving us better ways of doing that. But it's still exponential because you have to make choices and the consequences don't become uh, obvious until later. And you don't know what you have to undo and what the correct choices were. So it, yeah, it explodes exactly that. OK, is there a nice three coloring model for ternary computing or is it nicer with four colors? Well, four is not NP complete, three is NP complete, but. Yeah, when, when it comes to doing uh, four coloring, you can actually have NP complete four coloring models. Um, but basically, you're embedding the three coloring model into it. Um, mm -hmm. on, the, on the plane, I mean, the graphs that I've shown you here are planar, so we know that they're four colorable, but in general, the, the graphs, the networks that we're talking about are not planar. They can't be put in the plane without things crossing over each other. Uh, in fact, it's just thinking of it as drawing it out just, just doesn't work for you. Um, so you can do ternary computing, and yeah, you do need to have a color for each of the three values that you've got plus an extra color to start to control what's going on. Very few people have pursued that in detail because early on people showed that it really, there is a, mat, a matching between the problems. They are genuinely equivalent problems. Um, I may have lied there. I may have told you something that's not true, but the, 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 the sense of what I've said is carrying the truth of what's going on there. Kim has asked a question about human intuition bridging the gap. Um, and the, the challenge, Kim, there is, is that uh, you can get near misses uh, with, with intuition very, very easily, very, very quickly. Uh, so in particular, with, with a traveling salesperson problem, you can come up with a good network quite quickly by hand. But as soon as you try and prove that it's optimal, or as soon as you try and prove that there isn't one that's, that's a little bit better, then suddenly you've got a lot of stuff that you have to check. And again, the, the complexity of that just blows up. The devil is in the detail. If you give me a number, I can find two integers that multiply to, to nearly get there. So I'm only wrong by a couple of bits. You know, that's easy. And human intuition will let you do that very quickly. The difficulty is that you, you can't be close. You have to be exact. And that's, that's why human intuition, the, the, uh, the brain is, is an amazing pattern spotting machine. Uh, but sometimes the patterns that we see are not actually real, uh, and sometimes you're misled slightly, and that's why the, the devil genuinely is in the detail with this. I, I have to add a little anecdote there to that question. My PhD advisor, Eric Domain, for many years had a letter posted on his door that someone had sent him 
uh, there was some computer game or other that had been proven to be NP complete. And this guy had said, well, I'm an expert at this game. I can get through this level in this amount of time and I'm way better than all my friends. Do you think it's possible that I'm NP complete? And uh, it's just a very, very delightful. Um, well, it's, it's been yeah. shown, for example, that the game of Minesweeper mm -hmm. is, is NP complete, but people mm -hmm. go, yeah, but I can solve Minesweeper really easily. Yeah. Yeah, we're talking about arbitrary sized boards which are only partially populated. So again, you need to make decisions early and you don't know whether that's gonna work until very much later. People think that this one example is all they need to do. Likewise with things like Tetris. Yeah, if it's only this wide, then, then that's fine. But Tetris in general is, is what we start to talk about with complexity theory. An anonymous attendee has asked about papers and books to read about this. I don't have any specific references uh, you might know more about this than I do, actually. Well, I'm going to take an opportunity to plug my own book <laughs> called Games, Puzzles, and Computation, um, which is about exactly this kind of thing, about how computation relates to um, like graph coloring and other kinds of games and puzzles. Um, there's many good texts on theory of computation. Mine is, mine is more about these, these kinds of applications. Peter Winkler has made a good point that the traveling salesman problem is often expressed as find the shortest route. Uh, the technicality is that uh, in NP problems, uh, it always needs to be a decision problem, yes or no. It's not a case of finding an appropriate output. It's, it's getting a yes, no. So what you do um, with the traveling salesperson problem is you say, is there, a route, is there a route that has a better cost than this? And then if somebody claims to have found one, it's, it's polynomial to check. Now you can turn this into find an optimal one just by picking a number up here. And if the answer is this, then you lower that. And then you keep doing that in a, in a binary search to find the exact value that worked. And if you're dealing with finding a Hamilton cycle, then what you do is you say, is there a Hamilton cycle? Yes or no? And if the answer is yes, then you take out one edge. And you say, now is there a Hamilton cycle? If the answer is no, then you know that that edge is required for the Hamilton cycle. And then you can collapse the, that, that edge. And so there are ways of, of um, turning a find a solution problem into a yes, no problem. This is deeply technical. Uh, and it, Peter's exactly right. It's, it's very unfortunate that these things are often mixed. On the other hand, we can overcome the technicalities with, with these, these extra points. Is one extra color enough for all possible IO maps? I'm not sure. Or auxiliary colors. Uh, what we've done with the with the three colors is we need to have one color for true, one color for false, or one color for one and one color for zero. And then if that's all you have, then it's two coloring and two coloring is easy to solve. We've got that. Uh, so you need to add one other color. And what that's doing is it's allowing you to have chains of other colors, or it's allowing you to break a chain of other colors. Uh, if you analyze my AND gate, you'll find that the um, the node at the uh, top left is forcing the, the middle node in the thing to be blue, which then creates the other ones to be a chain, or forcing it to be uh, green, which forces the output to be red. And so we're using the, the blue as a controlling color. It's very much like the gate in the field effect transistor, but suddenly that's all you need. Um, so that's enough. We don't need any more than that. Um, and that's, uh, um, uh, you can add more colors. And indeed, so asking, is this network four colorable? Is this network five colorable? Perfectly reasonable questions. Ask giving a network and saying, what's the minimum number of colors? That's still an outstanding uh, question. Um, so um, these algorithms are all connected to each other. And usually what we do is we turn it into the three coloring problem and then just hammer away on that. But if you could find a, a, an efficient way of, of 10 coloring networks or 100 coloring networks in every case, then, then you've solved it because these things are interconvertible uh, up, up to small amounts of fiddling about. Um, Adam right. Chalcraft has posted uh, the classic text on NP completeness, but does make the connection that you really do need a math background for that. I shared a link to uh, Michael Sipser's book, which is... Uh... A standard text, uh, MIT and other places, but it is it is fairly accessible. Kate Jones, let's see, suggests the same phenomenon occurs in choices humans make in political organizations. 
we took the time to trace current situations backward, we could find the fatal decision that was made sometimes centuries ago. Ooh, interesting. Someone please set up an analysis of current disasters so we won't repeat the old mistakes. Well, if we were NP complete, yes. <laughs> well, that's that's what that's what game theory tries to do. The whole field of game theory is all about saying, here's our current situation, and, and uh, these are the these are the actions that we can take. And if we take these actions, we predict the following things will happen. The difficulty is in the quality of those predictions. And as they start to chain, then our certainty in those predictions decreases. The great thing about the field of, of digital mathematics is, is that we can chase these down with certainty. Uh, although once you start talking about Smullyan and, and paradoxes and Gerdelian results, that's not necessarily so certain, um, then, uh, then it becomes a, a, a problem again. Uh, but this is what historians try to do. They try and backtrack and understand not just the fact that uh, in, in the UK, the Battle of Hastings happened in 1066, and that was when William the Conqueror took over. Um, you know, it didn't have to be exactly that date. Why did it all happen? And uh, try and look for the, for the general sense of the causation rather than just the detail of what happened. That's what they're trying to do already. And we are limited as to the amount of, of power that we have. Um, Arthur in the Q&A has just said the three colored networks I've shown are all planar. Uh, it is true that three, that planar graphs are sufficient for NP completeness, but we don't usually uh, require that. We usually allow the graphs to be non-planar. There is a way of putting a widget in the middle. If you've got these two nodes and you want them joined and these two nodes and you want them joined, you can put a complicated set of nodes in the middle that, that ends up transferring the forbiddenness of color. So you can do that. Uh, Rod, on the, um, Rod has asked, is there a graph we can print out? Uh, yes, the links are on the uh, program page for my talk, there are links there to uh, uh, images and a PDF that has examples of those. Uh, quantum computation does not currently uh, threaten P versus NP as far as we know, but it does threaten um, factorization. Shaw's algorithm is a quantum algorithm that will allow us to factor numbers in polynomial time. Um, so that shows that factoring numbers isn't as high in the hierarchy as NP complete. Assuming NP complete is genuinely hard, assuming there is no algorithm for it, we know that um, factoring is, is below that, but probably above polynomial. Uh, but quantum computation does not threaten P and NP, probably. There's still a lot more to yeah. learn about that. We don't know. We haven't even proved that NP is genuinely hard. It may yet be the case that NP is, is not genuinely hard. Uh, but most, and, and I, I genuinely mean most, um, is uh, most people believe that it is. Dan Back has said, Bill Gates said, the biggest challenge in the 2010s was factoring large primes. Yeah, that's not true. Factoring large primes is really easy because the, the, the factor of the no primes have no factor. <laughs> But we know what he meant, that it's factoring large semi-primes. And in fact, as it turns out, um, if, if, you, if you pick two, no, two, two large primes and multiply them together and give me that, there's a very good chance I can factor it because the ones that are difficult are actually hard to come by. Um, RSA as a fact, as a, as a uh, encryption system is really, really easy to implement badly. And, and to have it so that it's not, in fact, secure. Although the math works, there are then practical difficulties in which primes you have to pick and, and, and more. So uh, this has been fabulous. So thank you, everybody. And thank you again, Colm. That was, that was a lot of fun. Absolute pleasure. Thank you.